All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Cool. Good enthusiasm. So welcome to the second ever Pushing Limits panel that we do in PAX Australia here. We did one last year as well, but that was on the Friday, so we now have a better time slot. Uh, time slot. My name is Peter. I work for HWBot, which is a worldwide overclocking website, and I'm here with Carl, Dino, Matt, Neil, James, and Josh from Team AU, which is a, the, the number one extreme overclocking team in Australia. So what we're going to do today is talk about overclocking. And overclocking is very simply put, the process of increasing the operating frequency of one of your system components with the idea to have higher performance, right? And some people will do it for gaming, some people want to do it for getting a faster video encoding, and people like Team AU do it to break records. They want to, to get the highest possible performance out of any system component, right? And that's what the extreme overclockers do. They use liquid nitrogen, um, uh, on, a, on a daily or on a weekly basis, right? So last year, we talked about the pure overclocking frequency. We showed a system running over 8 gigahertz, but this year, it's all about multi-core. So we're not doing 4 cores, we're not doing 8 cores, we're not doing 10 cores, we're doing 18 cores, right? Um, and actually, this year has been very crazy in the, the hardware space, especially the CPUs. AMD came out with two new, completely new designs. First, Ryzen, which, came, uh, which uh, gave us eight cores in the mainstream. And they also built a CPU called Threadripper, which gives us 16 cores, right? Before that, um, last year, Intel had the highest core specification with 10 cores on the high-end desktop and only four cores on the mainstream desktop. But also Intel, you know, they, they switched up their game and they added six cores on the mainstream with Coffee Lake and up to 18 cores with an arch architecture called Skylake X, uh, which you can find in the, the Core i9 products, right? Um, internet reaction, as usual, on fire. People loved a AMD coming back, you know, giving the heat to, to Intel, and they throw out their Intel CPUs, and, you know, they join the, the, Intel, the Intel game. Today, however, we're not going to pick sides. We only want to talk about what makes multi-core CPUs so complex, we also want to share some information on what are the challenges when you do multi-core overclocking. Um, and afterwards, we'll meet the, the, the guys from Team AU. They'll introduce what they do on a, on a, on a daily basis, how they, um, how they enjoy their overclocking hobby. Uh, we'll do a demo with 18-core overclocking using liquid nitrogen. And then afterwards, we'll also do a Q&A where you can ask basically anything that you want to know about overclocking. Right. So let's start about multi-core overclocking. Do you remember last year's panel? Who was here last year? Okay, I see a couple of people. I see a lot, a lot, a lot of new faces back. this year, great. <laughs> so this was the main slide, the key visual from last year. And what you can see here is the insane frequency increase between the year 2000 and the year 2005. So the, 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 the highest frequency ever achieved in 2000 was 1,613 1, megahertz. In 2005, we were up to seven gigahertz. But what happened then? Why did people, why did Intel, why did AMD stop pushing the frequency, right? Something must have happened around the year 2005. And what happened is this. So this is a chart of the performance in a specific multi-threaded benchmark called Cinebench R11.5. And you can see the performance scales with uh, the, the thread count and the core count going up. And in 2005, this happened. These are two CPUs that Intel launched in 2005 where they switched from a single core architecture to a dual core architecture. And there's two, two, uh, two types of, um, of uh, ideas behind here. So on the top right, you can see that there's one single gray area called a die, which has two cores. And below that, you have a different idea where you have two dies, which both are single core, that form one dual core, right? So, Talking about multi-core, when you're trying to design that, it's quite a complicated uh, idea. And we'll, we're going to run through sort of what are the complexities involved with having multi-core CPU designs. First up, let's give you some basic terminology. Um, I'll bring out a CPU here. The package is everything that makes up the, the CPU. So I'm not sure if we can switch 
to this camera here on the system? Operator? No? All right, let me show it this way down. So this is the package of a CPU. And you can see here that this entire green thing is called a PCB. And on the back side, you have some capacitors, but also the golden pins that connect to your motherboard, as well as the big thing here is called a die, which is where all the parts of the CPU are located, right? So you can see package is the big green thing with, with everything connected on the back. The die is the sort of the silver part in the middle where all the CPU thing is located. Uh, when we talk about power, that's all the, all, the, all the electricity that runs, all the current that runs through your CPU. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Another camera. See here. There you go. So you can see here, the green part is the package, and then the silver part here is called the die. And there's another one here. I'll be the microphone assistant. <laughs> So you can see here, the small one is the new Coffee Lake, which has six cores. And then the big one here is the 18-core processor. And you can see that not only does the size and package change, and this, this CPU is a lot smaller, but also the die size changes a lot, because here there's only six cores, and here we have to fit in 18 cores. Right? OK. Let's go, let's go back to the slides. All right, so power, I think it's, it, that's very obvious. The same with the thermals is very obvious, so I'm not going <laughs> to talk too much about that. The logic, when we talk about logic, it, that means everything inside the, the CPU has to communicate with each other. So when we talk about logic, that's the way everything is connected. So how the CPU will talk to another CPU or how the CPU will talk to the memory, anything like that. And then the bus is exactly that connection between those various parts. So what's the problem in terms of physical constraints when you're designing a multi-core CPU? Well, first of all, your package will have to expand, but you also need to build some kind of a socket around it. So have you seen in the, in the, in the picture of the Threadripper, it's a massive CPU that has a massive package. So yeah, if you want to have more CPUs in there, you need to expand that, the physical size, and that will affect directly, immediately, the motherboard that you design around it as well. Uh, the, the, the die itself needs to expand as well. So you could see from the, from the two CPUs here that the 18-core die is a lot bigger than the 6-core die. And that's just because you have to fit a lot more components inside. The problem with making a bigger die is that the more complex you make it, the, the more expensive it becomes to make. So that's why you know, the 18-core will be much more expensive than, for example, the 6-core. And then also you have to take into account that all these different cores will generate a lot more heat. So you need to find a solution um, for cooling these, these, these 18 cores when they're all running at the same time with the highest workload possible. In terms of interconnect, um, it also becomes a lot more complicated because if you have a single core, then you only have one sort of a CPU core that does all the calculations. But once you have multiple cores, they need to talk to each other so they don't do the same amount of work. You know? So you have core, core one has to talk to core zero, and then core one has to talk to core three, th four, five, six, up to 18, and then core two has to talk to all these cores as well. So you need to um, uh, make sure that the scheduling for, that, for those conversations is done properly. Uh, next problem is using one or multiple dies. So on this picture here, you can see that there's two dies uh, on, on one package. And you can see that uh, you know, where all the golden dots are. That's the back of the, that's the, back of the die that connects to the, to the PCB. And between there, you can see that there's some, some, some lanes, some buses. And that's purely to connect those two dies. In 2005, already, you know, the companies realized that in order to, to ensure that, the, that it doesn't become so complex, it's better to fit everything in one single die. Now, once you've designed your CPU, and you can see it on the left-hand side here, where you have a, you have a design with, um, this is the one that will go up to 18 cores. That one D CPU design is already complex enough, but you have to fit it in an entire system. So now you have to design uh, all your connection ports to it as well. You have to uh, design ways for your USB devices to connect to your, uh, to your CPU. You have to find a way how to connect your graphics cards to the CPU. So it, comes, it becomes very, very complex. Right, to sum up, uh, packet size is a, is a problem, power consumption is a problem, 
thermal limits are a problem, and then also the interconnects between the various parts of your CPU are also a problem. So what happens when we do overclocking? Well, first of all, in order to figure out in order to figure out how well we're doing the overclocking, we need to choose the right workloads. So we need to pick something that will test all of our cores, not just a single one. Um, secondly, we need to figure out what are the performance bottlenecks. So again, here, we need to focus on um, how can we increase or the, the, the speed at which the cores talk to each other. How can we increase the speed that each core can address memory? How can we get the memory to each core as fast as possible? We also need to figure out how can we get each core to get the data from the peripherals as fast as possible. Um, second, big, uh, second biggest problem with the, with the 18 cores is the power consumption. Now, a German overclocker did some power measurements with the 18 core. That's exactly the same CPU that we'll be using here. And he was looking at what the power consumption was at 5.5 gigahertz. So he's looking at the current that was flowing through the 12 volt rail which is directly feeding the CPU, and he saw 71 amps. So a quick calculation here means that it's 850 watts directly pushing through this very, very, very small die, actually. So 850 watts through this tiny thing here. Um, that's at 5.5, and currently the highest frequencies achieved are 5.7. Uh, through a multi-threaded workload. So that means that it's pushing more than a thousand watts to this really, really tiny dime. Last up, we need cooling, of course. So the, this particular architecture doesn't scale to the lowest temperature of liquid nitrogen, which is minus 196 degrees centigrade. It has a cold bug, which means that um, it, can no, it can no longer operate uh, below minus 120 degrees centigrade. Nevertheless, we are going to be using liquid nitrogen. Right, so this year there's two massive multi-core CPUs that were launched. First up, we have the AMD Ryzen Threadripper up to 16 cores. And on the other hand, we have the Intel Skylake X up to 18 core. And here we have the Threadripper with 16 cores. So you can see that the Threadripper is using a design where it's using multiple dies on one package. And it's connecting that through what they call the infinity fabric. So on the right-hand side, you can see in green, there's an infinity uh, icon. That is how they connect not only the CPU dies to each other, but also how they connect the memory and how they connect the peripherals. So it's sort of one big network of devices. On the Skylake X, however, it's one single die. So you can see on the left-hand side, all these sort of gold orange where it says CPU core. Uh, well, yeah, those are the CPU cores. Um, and it's, it's just all in, in one die, and what they use is sort of a mesh network. So each of the cores has one connection point that goes into one big network, right? It's two different implementations of essentially trying to solve the same problem of getting more cores into one package that you can use in your computer. Um, next up, I'll introduce Dino from Gigabyte. He'll say a couple of words about what it takes to design a motherboard to feed the power to this, uh, to this kind of a system. Hey guys, um, it's good to see some familiar faces from last year, that's cool, and a lot of new guys, fantastic. I'm going to talk about uh, Team AU in a little, little while, but um, I also, since we were talking about multi-core, I figured we probably should touch on about power design. You saw that 71 amp draw, that is insane. That is just out of the CPU. <laughs> that doesn't take it, that doesn't take it. Uh, graphics card and everything else into account. Absolutely insane. Um, so what Gigabyte's doing at the moment is, um, you know, 18 cores launching, we're like, all right, uh, we have a X299 Gaming 7 and Gaming 9, amazing motherboards, but they're only eight core, uh, I should say eight phase uh, power designs. So we're like, all right, if people really want to push <laughs> Our motherboards, we're going to have to up our game here. So uh, basically, we've um, designed a new board with a 12-phase 60-amp MOSFET design just so you can like give the 18-core chips an absolutely insane performance and, and power delivery because they really are just using an insane amount of power. 
So <clears throat> to do that, we also have to optimize PCBs so the PCBs from, on motherboards can go from four layer, six layer, and eight layer. As obviously as the power design is, gets more complex, boards like this one actually have an eight layer PCB, two ounce copper in each of the layers. So when you pick up a motherboard like this, which is what we're actually demoing here, it's just insanely heavy as well. There's a lot of copper in there, a lot of interconnects uh, to be able to get it to, to um, uh, run properly uh, for really high load, <coughs> for high loads. So VRM is where it's at. So uh, power design, normally, you know, motherboards for about last 10 years or so have gone through a huge transformation in power design when the multi-core CPUs uh, uh, started becoming more popular and in, in more mainstream PCs. So manufacturers have gone from these horrible uh, power design implementations and blown MOSFETs and chokes and whatnot to some really seriously uh, uh, heavy, uh, high amperage-based um, MOSFET solutions. So now most of the high-end motherboards like the one that I showed you that we're using actually uses either a 50 or a 60 amp per MOSFET driver solution that's all like an all-in-one solution. Um, <clears throat> in this particular instance, we're using Intersil, but there is also another company that um, also, uh, which is called PowerStage, which we also use depending on, uh, 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 you know, market availability. Um, so let's talk about TMU. So <clears throat> I go by Dino S22. Um, and these boys, uh, Young Pro Moloko, Fed Boy Not So Slim. Zero plus zero. Zero plus zero. He's got, uh, you guys, any of you on OCAU? A few? One, two here? This guy's got about 200 usernames. He keeps getting banned. Like, I think he's finally like, got one that he stopped trolling people, so he's finally calmed down a little. And Sniper was right at the end. I was looking at one of the slides that Peter was showing, and there's only one Australian flag there. I thought, mm, Peter, you should have picked a better slide. That was pretty bad. And in fact, it was actually around the 2005 <laughs> era as well. And actually, that was, I think that was Carl's uh, <laughs> Cinebench result as well that was probably in that, in that um, slide. But um, uh, we actually, eight days ago was our 10th anniversary. So in 2007, uh, Tim, you formed a little slide. So we went to uh, Atomic Live, I think it was, uh, event uh, for the first time, and we we were just a bunch of randoms on a forum. It's like, all right, we're, uh, you know, we're all pretty decent uh, uh, doing this thing. How about we join forces and you know see what we can do together, um, or how much damage we can deal? So we formed a little team. Like the team, we you know we're just a bunch of like you know uh, randoms from forums, but uh, we were actually quite decent at doing this sort of thing. So. Uh, we've taken just about every single world record there is to take in all these years. Um, uh, a lot of the guys, are, we, we take this as a, it's a bit of a fun project for us. So we all effort and, and, and all fun. Um, it's, it, there's a lot of, a lot of these guys come to these events and we always kind of joke, joke around about how little motivation we actually have. But as soon as the event kicks on, you know, we're LN2 fumes start coming out. And uh, we're a totally different, uh, totally different crew. Um, we um, we have there are quite a few tiers of, of clockers on HW bot. So uh, most of us are on the elite uh, level. Now we don't necessarily chase ranks because the ranking system got a little uh, well, got changed a little, and we we sort of <laughs> decided that that's not for us. So we'll just go chase after all records, and also partic we participate in a thing called the uh, HW Board Country Cup. Um, and uh, we uh, come together with the guys from uh, OCAU, which is an Overclockers Australia forum. So we'll do gatherings once a year, and we participate in Country Cup. Country Cup is, is actually World Cup of overclocking. In the last four years, we've won it three times and finished second 
uh, last year to Greece. So we need revenge this year, actually. So <laughs> a little extra motivated this year to, uh, to um, yeah, do it again. So Australians are actually pretty decent at uh, uh, this hobby. And, uh, you know, um, if you guys, and you don't necessarily have to be an elite overclocker uh, to be able to participate and, and help out the team. So when I see you, we actually have threads where we uh, let people know what sort of hardware we need, because sometimes it's quite old hardware that can be as, as old as 10 years old uh, that we need, that we may not have. Uh, the, to be able to complete certain stages because uh, for this thing you need like you need to have like a 30 people team to be able to actually compete properly so it's not just five of us there's like should be about th roughly 30 people kind of competing in this um, so we get locked in a room in Adelaide with like 2,000 liters of liquid nitrogen about 10 of us at least and uh, you know we come out alive somehow um, a, a week later and uh, and then we hang on to our results until the very end of all the stages. And, and yeah, we've been kind of coming out on top most of the time, which is, you know, fantastic. But uh, so we've been trolling Germany, and they're watching this right now because this is going out live on Twitch. I'm setting out a challenge again. Hello, Germany. Hello, USA. You know, bring it on this year. We're coming to get you again. Thrash you again, I should say. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Um, so I want to kind of talk a little bit about gaming and overclocking and how the two kind of relate or connect. Uh, so I, I tend to play a lot of PUBG these days, but also Counter-Strike. I uh, really like Counter-Strike. Um, how many of you actually play Counter-Strike or kind of first person PUBG? A lot of PUBG as well. Kind of a similar, similar game. So <clears throat> you've got, generally when you're, especially HW bot, it is a team thing. So you can't, you know, you can't just uh, go out on your own and just win everything. You do rely on your teammates, but it's, it is a different, it's, it's a more complex uh, uh, relationship. So I want to kind of compare some of these guys. So <coughs> James here, young pro on the left, he's your uh, Cold Zero. You guys know who Cold Zero is from SK, right? He's the sort of the entry fragger, the clutcher. Uh, Carl is your typical kind of all-rounder, like Zipniks from um, Australis, and, and he'll sort of be able to be good at everything. So he will like test every single operating system there is to test different versions, different drivers. He'll go into absolutely any and every detail, because when you're overclocking, it's all about efficiency. So we all have, say, a seven gigahertz CPU, then you know, how else can we beat someone? And it's through those little 1% differences in you know, how we cool the system, what sort of memory we're running on the system, the drivers, the OS, the tweaks, the, the lot. So that's, the, that's what Carl is. I'm, I'm more of a, your IGL, like Fallen or something. Um, I'll kind of motivate the team. I'll see where the, you know, team's at mentally, try and get the guys to kind of focus on different areas because, you know, this is kind of very, very challenging, uh, uh, you know, sport, if you want to call it, mentally as well. Uh, there is always a lot, you always have to have a lot, you know, you take a lot into consideration when you're doing these sort of things. So you can be very demotivating when you're constantly crashing and seeing blue screens and the results are not going your way. So I kind of try, try and find a new way to uh, uh, do these things. So we also <coughs> get a lot of new guys uh, joining the ranks and we are running a workshop uh, at PAX as well in PC free play area. So we're actually teaching people how to overclock, and we would love to teach you guys and actually get you guys to jump on the machines and overclock yourselves as well. Um, so Zero Plus Zero and Fed Bonoso Slim, some of our newcomers, and there's a, a bloke right here in the first row, Jordan. He drove from country New South Wales. He's 17 years old, super keen to do this. So he's here as well, four packs, he's with us He's overclocking with the extreme guys using liquid nitrogen for the first time. For the first time, he's loving it. So if you guys are also keen to do that, we can <clears throat> get you to jump on one of the rigs as well. we'll it will run you through its paces and whatnot. And uh, yeah, show you how on an 8700K overclocks on uh, liquid nitrogen as well. I'll pass it on to Peter for the presentation. All right, let's try this. Okay. 
So um, we, we're already switched back to the system. So what we're doing right now is we're going to cool down the CPU by pouring the liquid nitrogen in something what's called an LN2 container. And the bottom of the LN2 container is connected to the CPU. So yeah. we're, pour, we're, we're cooling down the copper, which in turn cools down the CPU. So now we're going to try and boot up the system. And you can see on, on this side here, there's a, there's a debug LED, which helps us uh, debug in, in, in case there is any, any issues. So we're going to go into the BIOS. And then hopefully it will show up in the big screen. There he is. OK. Uh, and we've prepared all this. So we've made profiles where we can load exactly what we want to do. So yeah, go to load profiles. And then let's try profile number two. So our first task of the day is to run a multi-threaded workload at 5.5 gigahertz with all 18 cores enabled. Uh, so yeah, uh, hold on. Uh, nope. Let's cool it down first. Oh yeah, the temperature. So okay, right now the temperature is still positive, so it's about 6.6 .6 degrees centigrade. And then when it's about minus 20, we'll uh, reboot the system, save these settings, and go into the operating system. Uh, one thing I'll, we can already show, actually, is um, if you can uh, get the CPU voltage up. Yeah, so what we've configured the, the V core at is 1.4 volts. And you'll see that when we try to do the 6 gigahertz validation, so it's just like the, the screenshot idling in Windows, we'll use a lot more voltage. But for a stable, um, uh, high load, uh, overclocked system, we cannot use too much voltage. And the reason is basically what I showed in the presentation as well. The moment that you scale up the voltage, you'll, you, you'll use so much more power that the, the CPU itself becomes very unstable. All right. Oh, yeah, we can try to reboot already. We're booting in the operating system at 4.5 gigahertz, which is a very uh, stable config configuration that we know. We, we, we could run that uh, basically on an all-in-one as well, this, this 4.5 gigahertz. In before blue screen. <laughs> Fingers crossed. If you can see the, if you could see the debug, like you, you'll see that it was like cycling through, basically initializing all the different parts of the system. So it's, it'll start with the CPU, then it'll initialize the memory, and then all the different peripherals. And on these uh, complicated platforms, it can take a little while sometimes. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. And it's even loading the operation. Going like that or like that? Like, is he doing a late and cute? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! It's even stable to go into the operating system. So we'll go to um, to the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility at the very top to adjust the ratios uh, at runtime. So basically, in the operating system. Right, so uh, first thing to note is in the lower left corner, you'll see that the maximum core frequency right now is 4.5 gigahertz, and that'll go up as we increase the frequency. Um, in the, under the uh, uh, advanced tuning, under the core section, we see that all these, all these multipliers, so one active, two active, and so forth. You can change the ratios, basically the frequency, depending on how many uh, active cores you have in a workload. So let's say, for example, you have a single thread at workload and you want to run that one as fast as possible. You can do that. You could, for example, configure one active core to, let's say, 50. And then when you have a single thread at workload, when only one core is active, it'll run that at 5 gigahertz and everything else at 4.5 gigahertz. Uh, but obviously, that's not what we want to do. So we'll go to 18 cores and push that one to 50x. Can I have a refill? Uh, not yet. So it shows in orange, which means that these are the settings that will change, but are not changed yet. It will only change when you click apply, which you can do now. Uh, minus 95 to minus 100. 
All right, so what we can see in the lower left corner already is that the maximum core frequency is now running at 502 gigahertz. So that means that the entire chip, all 18 cores, are running at 5 gigahertz. All right, we can try 52x, for example. Yep, apply. All right, so we have to wait a little bit. No, oh, uh, it'll pop up. It's, uh, it's uh, configuring itself. So, yep, there we go. So, uh, minus, uh, so the, the cold bug is, as Dio is asking, is, uh, is when the CPU shuts down, when it's just too cold to operate. And on this particular CPU, it's about minus 120 uh, degrees. So to configure it, we want to have it around minus 100. And then we, when we load up the workload, we'll pour in a little bit to sort of make a, make a temperature buffer for the high load that's coming to the CPU. So we're at minus 94, 95 now. So let's try 54x. All right, apply. And then on the top right of the system, we can open Cinebench. There we go. Uh, yeah, make it a bit smaller, maybe. I'm leaving it on this tent. Uh, yeah, so I'll say, like, I'll say when you have to pour for... Uh, maybe we can also open Task Manager to show that all the cores are being, are being used. Yeah, hi. Right. Yeah, on the other one. No. Yes. Change graph to... Perfect. All right, so this is 5.4 gigahertz. This is relatively easy, so let's try this one already. Click Run. And you can see that all the cores are jumping up to 100% load. And there we go. So this was uh, all 18 cores at 5.4 gigahertz. So let's try to go back to the XTU, the tuning utility, and change it to 54. Uh, yeah, sorry, 55. Uh, okay, apply. Wait until the maximum core frequency has changed. There we go. I've never run Cinebench on an 18 core chip before. This is crazy fast. All right, go back to Cinebench. And we can, can you pour a little bit now, so to buffer it, all right, and run. Let's see if it's stable. Turn off the firewall as well. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, there we go, 5.5 gigahertz at 18 cores. All right, cool. You wanna try 5.6? Sure, oh, hang on, what's the record at? Which frequency, 5.6 or 5.7.4. <laughs> Rebooting. So okay, new, now we have to reboot, go back into the, the BIOS and set our profile for CPU Z frequency. So we might have to warm it up a little bit. So we use the torch to uh, basically heat up the copper of the LN2 container. Uh, do you need to use a torch? Not really, but the torch is the fastest way to do it. Uh, the reason why you want to have it very fast is because uh, every moment that your system is not running, the, it, there is no load on the motherboard, so there's no heat generation. Uh, and when, when you don't have that, uh, there's a higher risk of having condensation. So we heat it up as quickly as possible again to get it to run as quickly as possible again. troubleshooting 99 percent <laughs> troubleshooting yeah. and then when you actually get scores and stuff that's like that's the icing on the cake really mm. so that that's um because there are quite a few things things that you have to think about especially when you start pushing records then you're configuring memory speed and timings and trying to mac match the cache frequency and the core frequency and the voltage <coughs> sync it in with the right temperature so there's quite a, quite a few things to kind of consider to try and get the rig going, and then also condensation, uh, because once the once um, you know uh, 
is cold air goes over the motherboard. Uh, if it starts condensating, you can get water droplets. Also, when you're pouring as well, sometimes some water drops will actually drop into like thin channels if you're not kind of careful. There's quite, <laughs> there's quite a few things. That All right, so we go into the low profiles again. Oh, I think, hold on, the screen is switching over there. All right, so now we're going to load profile number three, which is our, our CPU-Z, sort of a validation profile. And you can go back into the CPU voltage to just show that we've configured the CPU vCore slightly different. So here we set 1.55 volt. Um, 1.4 or 1.55, it doesn't really change that much in the stability. The only thing that we are able to do with 155 is, is put more of the power that we want to put through that CPU on the frequency side rather than putting it on the high load workload side. Um, yep, so we can reboot again. We're at minus 72 right now. So I'm keeping the temperature there. We were at 100, but because sometimes uh, Booting too cold will actually affect the silicon um, and it will not actually let it um, boot in. So I'm kind of using a safe temperature as well myself until I see that, you know, the, well, actually you've got to keep an eye on the postcode because especially with X299 and multi-core, like large multi-core CPUs, it takes a while for it to, for all the systems and processes to kind of lock in before it starts going into an operating system. So. Like I'm looking at the postcode here, and when I start seeing the ones that are familiar to me, that I know are going to OS, which is now, I can start kind of pouring. And it's exactly what's happening. Now All right. Bring it back to 100. Yeah, yeah. So back to minus 100, and we'll open the uh, Intel XTU again, and we'll do exactly the same process, but instead of running the new workload, we're going to just try and see how far we can push the push the frequency. Uh, no, you have to close it. Yeah, close it. All right, so go back to 18 cores, and we can already go to uh, 50. Even though we know that you can run already at 5.5 gigahertz, when you do the overclocking, you always want to take steps. So even if you know, okay, I can run at 5.5 gigahertz, there's no need to jump from 4.5 directly to 5.5. Better to take steps of 200, 300 megahertz to just build it up slowly. We keep saying that to the guys at the workshop too, and then instead of them going 4 gigahertz for one day, everyone's like, 5 gigahertz, 1.6 volts, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually this um, software is quite safe to use, so even if you uh, do a blue screen or crash or whatever, it'll just reset back to whatever the BIOS settings were. So it's not actually remembering any of these settings. So it's... Uh, All right. So we can go up again. Uh, let's do 5.2 and then apply. So it, with these 18 cores, it also takes a while before all the, all the uh, frequencies are set internally. So what we do is we always monitor the lower left corner where it says maximum core, core frequency. Once that one jumps, jumps up, that's when we configure the next, the next frequency. Um, so we're at 5.22, so two more. Oh, no, just keep the minus 105, yeah. So we're at 5.4, so we can do two more. All right. That's configuring very quickly now. 5.6, so let's try one more. Any second now. No. <laughs> so now we have this uh, this cold boot bug. So you have two problems with uh, with cold, low, uh, low temperatures. One of them is called cold bug, which is the temperature at which the CPU or the graphics card would stop operating. But what we have now is, a, is called a cold boot bug. So that means that the CPU can still operate, but it cannot really initialize. So it has troubles starting up. Yeah, the electrons are not moving freely. <laughs> So 
So minus just, 77, just we're back well, in the operating system. When you crash, the QR codes don't actually help. Like in <laughs> Windows 10, like you scan the QR code of why you crashed and it doesn't tell you. Thanks, Neil. I've tried. <laughs> Probably the only All right, one. We're waiting has. to go back to the uh, to the other screen. It's already booted up in the operating system. There we go. Beautiful. All right, let's go to five two now immediately. Come on, Matt. Matt is snappy. <laughs> Give it more vehicle. All right, we're at five two. Let's try five five. Let's go in steps of three hundred this time. Two more. Oh, no. Okay, five 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 seven now. <laughs> <laughs> Check the mouse. Now I have to. Uh, I have to wait. It's not set yet. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, it's going. For those of you that All right, five, seven, two. Let's try like one more. ADAD AD spam. Oh, we just mouse spam. Yeah. Is it working? All right, five, eight, two. Let's try five, nine. Is this CPU deleted? Yes. So we have to worry about two layers of thermal paste. One between. Five, nine. Let's try one more. Another one between the HS and the CPU core. So sometimes right, open CPU you can wait, 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 wait. lose mouse. It, it basically refers to thermal paste not kind of transferring efficiently anymore. So if we can't reach what we could before, uh. <laughs> parameters like that, <laughs> it could, yeah. we've probably lost mount. So one of the like thermal paste either underneath the copper container or the CPHS is probably not not transferring properly so the CPU in fact is actually running probably a lot warmer than normal. We're just de it's we're still, just still booting, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry? We're just demonstrating the troubleshooting part at the moment. <laughs> we're already at 5.9 so we're, we're getting there. That's not good enough. Everyone wants to see 6. <laughs> I over promised. Sorry guys. <laughs> this is also also quite representative of, of overclocking. Um, what you've done previously, you may not be able to reach in the next session, or the next session you might exceed what your limits were the previous session. Um, variables change. So as you can see, like the, this application doesn't remember anything from what we tried before. So just booting what we said in the BIOS, which makes it a lot easier to recover after it failed. Multiple times already. All of that, right? They'll, they'll, that's probably what they're going after. But you also, you are destroying your warranty. You're not going to get warranty from Intel uh, if you send them <laughs> an HS and a, and a PCB separately in a box, right? But uh, honestly, the, the the temperatures are actually pretty decent on the CPUs. Like we were, all the guys were overclocking their rigs to like 5 gigahertz, 4.9, 4.8 in the workshop. Yep. And it wasn't hitting some insane 100 degree temps. There was like 75 degree load or something like that, right? Okay. So it's I not I think two good. generations ago, it was an issue. Yes. And, yeah. and in the last 12 months, they've fixed the pace a little bit and, and the, yeah. the, the thermal transfer is better. So there's probably a lot less re required yeah. for right now. Look at a 7700K on a pretty basic air. It, quite happily will peak at like 88 degrees on the warmer days we had recently. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's yeah. a very hot CPU and that's just not overclocked. Yeah, and look, not all CPUs are equal. Some have worse yeah. pace than others, some yeah. are really good in some, so, you know, it's, but as Dino said, it, it's risky business and... The gains aren't necessarily... The gains right. aren't. Yeah. You might gain 50 megahertz or you might not gain much and just have a cooler CPU and there's no real gain in that. Yeah. Like, it, it, they, they warranty it up to whatever it gets to, right? So it's, it, it's not really an issue, so. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those, I want my five gigahertz 8700K people. <laughs> so I actually did a YouTube video to show people how to delete. So I use a Debauer delete tool and everything. You can, you can search up Dino S22 on YouTube. And yeah, it is kind of cool having a five gigahertz rig, but yeah, you know, it's not really necessary. Like you it's can, a bit of a bragging right. It is a, it's just a bragging right there. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to be super nerd again, I guess. Also, I just wanted to touch back on the topic of different type of thermal pastes and that, you know, uh, 
extreme overclockers do tend to go through quite a lot of it. Think of it as tyres for a, a Formula One team. Formula One teams go through a huge number of um, sets of tyres in a single Grand Prix weekend and over a year they go through close to 100, 120 sets of tyres. Similar sort of deal for, for overclockers. Um, always going through, making sure we've got the right mount, you know, uh, pace between the core uh, HS, HS, heatsink, etc. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those sort of consumables that, that, that come about. Yeah, um, probably like a little tube of three to five mils of pace. I probably used half of one yesterday, just constantly mounting um, to see if the CPU would work. It didn't work. I'd clean it off and it was delittered, so I had to clean under and, uh, the IHS as well. Try it again, didn't work. Swapped another CPU in, that worked fine. Swapped it out, tried the CPU a third time, using more paste as well, and end of the day, just the CPU's dead. So that's, you know. That's overclocking. That's overclocking. And I mean, that was a good several, several hundred dollars CPU, but Intel are very nice. You just don't tell them that you broke it and you return it. <laughs> um, I just. <laughs> I'm just gonna like not get my Intel in. guys already at the door. Like, <laughs> where's this Neil guy? I'm getting it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That, that's nah. probably why Dan doesn't return my emails for free. Just <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's that's the that's the game. I mean, that's the fun, really. So, I did something bad. I killed a CPU, and I could either just throw my hands up in the air and rage quit, which I have done before. Or I'll literally now have to go buy a new CPU and start all over again. It's the game. That is fun. Oh, and fun, but debt as well. Yeah. Flip side of that is you can have a CPU that you just torture and torture and it's torture, true. and it keeps going. It never dies. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wanted to add something on the deleting and the temps and stuff as well. Um, a lot of people disregard the fact that their cases and their airflow is rubbish. And they will literally get 15 or 20 degrees sometimes on CPU, I like it, reduce CPU load if you have the right intake and outtake. And if there's no real like intake blockage into your case, like it's actually can be, make a huge difference. A lot of cases now, are, they look pretty. They've got the RGB thing going and they've got this awesome panel at the glass, front, the blah, blah, blah. Glass. But it's a rubbish design because it doesn't allow airflow to run through the case properly. And like once you move, like especially front panel in a lot of cases, I was just testing something recently, uh, you know, I, I don't want to murder those guys because they're not isolated, but like I just removed the front panel, I saw 15 degree difference in CPU load temp. It's insane, like it's a, that's a huge difference. So, you know, even just thinking about how your, your airflow is getting into the case and out of the case, and whether you have any dead spots in the case as well can make a bit of a difference um, all, like, on your, to your system's health and how your graphics card's performing, what temperature it's at as well, you know, so. Okay, well, this is our last shot. We're gonna have another one last crack at six gig. We're hitting five nine. So either our mount's not right or something, we'll probably have to do a little bit more troubleshooting, whatever, but. Uh, Yep, let's give it a let's give it a go and see if we can get six gig going. More Vico. More Vico, higher yep. clock. Higher score. It's all on you, Matt. Five, five, two. No, six man, not five two, six. <laughs> Walking the dog. Come on, Matt, get good. Yeah, normally when you're trying to chase frequency record, you don't, you, you kind of, like in Gigabyte side, we normally run another software called Gigabyte uh, Tuning Utility, GT, or GTL. Um, and uh, it's a little bit more efficient when just setting, setting cores and stuff. But there's not a lot of, there's, it's not a huge difference, but it could make a difference in the 100 megahertz. So. I believe. I could fly. Fingers crossed. Is this all right? Um, no, yeah. 592 still. You still get CPUs, though. No, no. 
that's going to crash the system. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's 5.9. It's, it hasn't actually said it yet. The bottom right corner. Yay! 6G. <laughs> Woo! We were totally not pretending we couldn't do it and just did it right at the end. This literally couldn't. We were a bit, yeah, having, uh, struggling a little. Couldn't really script this, but it's, uh, this is really representative of, of overclocking. You know, we were crashing at, what, 5.7? Go through tabs as well. 5.7, 5.8, and now through to 6. So it's about persistence and persevering with, with the direction that you want so to try to get to. This motherboard that we're using, not even released yet. In fact, it's not even on Gigabyte's website. This is like an engineering sample still. Like it's on some F1C BIOS, super like early BIOS. So, uh, so. <laughs> no. Oh, hang on. Oh, what happened? One point two gigahertz. No, wait. How did that happen? Now nah, we crashed probably. Yeah. It's, it's still, it's in slow mode. It's in slow mode at 1.2 gigahertz. Whoa, oh, whoa. Oh. <laughs> we're getting We're running in reverse, like this is like Bathurst 1000 in reverse. All right, guys, I think uh, we have to wrap it up here. Thank you for joining uh, this, uh, this panel and hope to see you guys next, uh, next year again. Also, we have the workshops near the PC Free Play, so if you want to learn how to do this kind of overclocking, maybe not the six gigahertz, you can just uh, hop on over. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers.